We're very happy to be here, and I, I think uh, Dora's trying to raise my self-confidence by letting me start, but I, I will soon, she will soon take over. He, so our, our Bush book was published two years ago by Princeton Press, but, but we continue uh, t to make progress. Dora, can you remind me what, what we were trying to do in the photograph? Are these three buddies? Not necessarily, we don't know. <laughs> so what we do know is our questions. And, a, and, and, and we're both economists, but we think that these are broad social science questions. Uh, when are men uh, willing to sacrifice for the common good? So as economists who often talk about free riding and individual ruthless pursuit of self-interest, there's more and more economists uh, trying to work on this question of sacrifice. Uh, and one of our core questions in one of our first papers on this topic is when did men desert during the US Civil War? We're also interested in the benefits of friendship. And as empiricists, we have new results to show you on surviving US Civil War prisoner of war camps. And we, when we presented this to other economists, they immediately started talking about that television show, Hogan's Heroes. And I, uh, this won't be as jolly as, uh, as, as that TV show. This will be the brutal Andersonville with a very high death rate and really horrible conditions of how men cope under extreme life and death conditions in a non-market setting. Another question that our empirical work has taken a look at is how do communities, residential communities, deal with betrayal? We came up with an empirical design that Dora will tell you about of, of what we can learn, and all our subjects are dead, so it's hard to survey them, uh, can't play games with them, uh, of, of what we can do with historical records to take a look at how deserters were treated back in their home communities. Our work is also a large part about the costs and benefits of living and working in a diverse community. And of course, that's a topical issue for the modern research university, but in modern cities as well. And we think that our work has interesting implications, uh, empirical implications for the costs and benefits of being in a diverse society. Our work, there's going to be several questions we're going to be talking about. The size of peer effects, uh, where we'll be very clear what we mean by peer effects in a couple of moments. Uh, under what circumstances, in what social environments, uh, are people civically engaged? Of, of, and we'll have observable indicators of what it means to be civically engaged. And our work will build on some of Robert Putnam's work in bowling alone, of, of sort of standard social capital indicators. Uh, and again, we'll come back to again and again throughout our talk today, the long run versus short run effects of living and working in a diverse environment. And that's, um, I think I've exhausted myself. Professor, I'm gonna let you in. Okay. So Matt tends to be the funny one. I like to get down to business. And I should point out that we're, we come from an environment where people interrupt the speaker constantly. So please feel free to interrupt. So why do we want to go back to the Civil War? It's, we think it's a really neat setting. It's uh, roughly 9% of Union Army soldiers deserted. If you look at who survived the Civil War, it's about 14% of soldiers had ever deserted. Clearly, there are a lot of benefits to deserting. And uh, we have also a lot of men who became POWs, much more than in modern wars. And it's, from our point of view, it's nice also because it's a horrific war. It's, uh, the death rate is around 14%. A lot of this is from disease, but uh, the battles were also horrific as well. The sample that we have is representative of the northern population controlling for age. And one of the things that we have here is we have really unique microdata. What we like about it is it's a high stakes setting. It's uh, you're not looking at whether or not people join bowling leagues. You're not looking at whether or not they join the parent-teacher association. These are decisions that are being made that really uh, affect your own probability of dying, but also those of your buddies. And the community that you have is the 100 men in your company. These companies were rarely replenished. So what's nice is we actually really can observe the community. A lot of work that looks at social capital might look at the entire metropolitan area, which is arguably a little bit too large. But instead, we actually really know who are you with all the time. The data come from a randomly selected 
sample. There are 331 white infantry companies. We used 303 in the analysis because the remaining companies weren't available yet. There's also a sample, a smaller sample of black infantry companies. And how were these companies formed? So yes, a lot of them were formed at the community level. And uh, company is going to be one of our key indicators. But uh, men often had no idea what type of company they were joining. Sometimes they might enlist somewhere further away, be, away because uh, later on as uh, communities were desperately trying to find men, they were enlisting men enlisted for a bounty. Sometimes men would hear rumors early on in the war that this regiment would be going to the front, so they'd try and actually find the company that would be leaving much sooner. And what has also been done is these records have been linked to various census records, and they've also been linked to uh, pension records as well. So we really, what the final product is, it's a longitudinal database that gives you the complete life histories of these men from about 1850 until death. And for those who are interested in the data, the data are available for download at this address. Let me give you an example of what these sorts of records look like. So uh, these are military service records. They were transcribed after uh, the end of the Civil War. You had an army of clerks in Ford's theater. Uh, there were so many of them in so many papers that the floor eventually collapsed, uh, killing a couple of them. But uh, for example, for Jeremiah Biglow here, you learn his complexion is dark, eyes are black. It's, uh, he's from uh, New York. He's listed here as being a farmer. It's, uh, and here he died of uh, wounds sustained, killed in action, and uh, from wounds at the Battle of Gettysburg. Going back uh, here, you can find Jeremiah Biglow in the 1850 census and uh, his wife Eliza and eight-month-old daughter underneath. He know, owns no real estate wealth worth anything, but uh, he has some $300 in personal property wealth. Later on, men became eligible for pensions. This is actually the pension application of a black soldier where, again, you get basic information. It's uh, what the man is applying for. Although we did not use uh, a lot of the pension records in the book, later on, if we get to work that we've done later, these pension records show up. I'm just going to move this cable so we have less chance of a trip for you. So here he is applying again. It's uh, oftentimes the first application might be rejected. So here he's uh, <coughs> applying for enlargement on right shoulder. He's blind in the right eye and the right arm is nearly useless. And this gives the result, the pension ruling. He's approved for loss of sight of right eye and tumor in a right shoulder and he's receiving $12 a month. So in around 1900, $12 a month was about 35% uh, of the income of a manufacturing worker. Men also were examined by a board of examining surgeons. And yes, doctors had bad handwriting even back then. <laughs> Some things don't change. So here, everything is sort of described in loving detail. But from these records, one can actually obtain also information about uh, the basic medical conditions that a man had. Now, looking at uh, the problem of desertion, who was loyal, there were very few sticks that really could be applied. So yes, some deserters were shot. However, Lincoln recognized that in a democracy, you can't uh, shoot a lot of men. Uh, people simply won't stand for it. Uh, this is in contrast with, say, uh, 
what Stalin did is he had tanks behind uh, men and they were ordered to shoot anyone who tried to desert and for good measure the families of deserters were sent to the gulag. So we have a very different situation. It's uh, you don't have these types of sticks and your chances, if you did desert, your chances of being caught were very little, and most of the time deserters were simply sent to fight again. You needed the men to fight. And there were few carrots also. Its uh, pay was low and it was often irregular. It simply wouldn't arrive on time. <coughs> So one of the things that we do is we look at desertion, we look at uh, being absent without leave, and we look at arrests, and we do it both for blacks and for whites. And our interest in, is in what's the importance of individual characteristics, of company characteristics, where company characteristics, we're going to be focusing on heterogeneity. So uh, how heterogeneous is the company in terms of occupation, in terms of uh, nativity, so both the state where the person was born, foreign country as well. And also in terms of age, we also look at ideology, where uh, if you're from a pro-Lincoln County, then maybe there are more community sanctions against you if you desert, but uh, also maybe this is also an indication that uh, you are more committed to the cause. And we're also able to look at morale. Was the union winning recently? How many men had died recently? For uh, the black soldiers, we have some measure of pre-war social ties. Were they from the same plantations? And we also, for the black soldiers, we have some information on officers, such as were they an abolitionist? Do you want to take over for a minute? So what we were up to in this part of the empirical work is, as Dora said, taking a look at, uh, at, at these conditional probabilities of one of these events occurring. And, and the very cool thing about what uh, Dora and Robert Fogel built in these data sets is these revealed preference indicators of, uh, of, of, of tenacity, of, of, of a, despite having no clear incentive, having no self-interest incentive in a pure economic sense of, uh, of these non-market factors that we're about to document <laughs> influencing behavior. We, in our paper, uh, he Heroes and Cowards, a, our major measure of shirking is to desert. And as Doris said a moment ago, it, it, the rational strategy, the self-interested strategy was to desert. If your sole goal was to survive, you should desert, but that imposes an externality on all the other members of your group. And so th there's an interesting issue. Do you internalize that externality, uh, or is your sole focus to survive and thus you run? Across our sample of roughly 30,000 white soldiers, so as Dora said, we have roughly 300 war companies with 100 soldiers in each company. So there's roughly 30,000 soldiers who we have this life cycle history for. And so in the hazard models we estimate, there will be 30,000 soldiers who we are watching their wartime experience. In any community study, you face an issue of how you quantify uh, homogeneity or heterogeneity within the company. And as Dora alluded to, our measures of company diversity are a, w across these war companies, uh, diversity with respect to geography, age, and occupation. And in the recent economics literature, we're going to posit that those, all else equal, those war companies that are more homogeneous that we're going to see better behavior that the, in, the, in the sense of not shirking. So intuitively, if everyone's a first cousin of yours in your war unit, do we see less free riding? Do we see less desertion in those units? Do we see more social capital? And so when I first got excited about this study, I'm an environmental economist. I'm not an economic historian. My reason for being interested in this project was back to Eleanor Olmstrom's work. When do people not free ride? When can you solve the tragedy of the commons issue? When will people step up without economic incentive? And what excited me about what Dora and Fogel had built was a laboratory to take a new look at when do we get good behavior even without formal economic incentives? And for Chicago economists, that's kind of funky. But, but, but economics is building bridges. Sure. Did you have any information about how they felt uh, about their enemies? 
I mean, that's a seat of the war. Right? Because the information has to come from how they felt about the enemy, has to come from letters. And uh, here, you always worry, is it an unbiased sample, or what sort of sample of letters are you getting? There's certainly, you probably observe changes over time, is what people have reported. Certainly, courage was admired, so whether it was by the enemy or someone else. However, as you get the war gets more into the South, there is much more of an anti-slavery component that actually starts to show up in these letters. So I think that's one of the sort of things that's striking. And actually, one of our results that we obtained from our hazard model is that as the war goes on, men become sort of a more committed. It's, uh, so you do observe sort of this greater commitment. Uh, so, and there actually are some cases where after, say, the massacre at Fort Pillow, where uh, blacks tried to surrender, but uh, were basically killed, that uh, soldiers took this, white soldiers took this very badly, and uh, really weren't particularly lenient in showing mercy towards the enemy after this. But you were right that the intensity, uh as an empiricist, it's hard to make project progress on hatred of, of uh, if you were pushing us in the direction, how much of this is like a football team who gets really ready for Sunday when you really hate the Trojans from USC. And I, and in, intensity, of, it's hard as an empiricist to quantify that. And, and I, and, and I, so what we are able to do, what we do here, and I, Dora, please correct me, our units here are, are yeah. Percent yeah. Pr probability. I mean, they, these are so we have a an average desertion rate of roughly nine percent. Uh, and what we're asking here in this bar graph is all else equal. Uh, as we shift across some of our key indicators that Dora outlined before, so all else equal, if you're in a time of high morale, where again what that meant was that the union was winning battles. Everybody loves a winner. You can see that the desertion rate falls to roughly six percentage points. All else equal. If you are in a, from a pro-Lincoln County, uh, an, an ideologically committed company, that also has a significant reduction in the probability of deserting. So I read this bar chart is under what circumstances, in the absence of economic incentives and knowing that Lincoln is not a hard ass, uh, under, that we see very large changes in desertion rates depending on the socio environment that men fought in. But the largest effect if you turn off, if you set, if you fight in homogeneous companies, an enormous effect on reducing the desertion rate. And the way Dora and I interpreted this correlation is that this fits into this uh, public goods and ethnic fragmentation literature that a number of economists and a number of political scientists, and I would guess one of the reasons I wanted to be here was, was to meet anthropologists. I, 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 I would hope that interdisciplinary diversity is good. It's, uh, a, and, and that this is an intuitive result, but to take this to a very different setting during wartime, I think is one of the reasons folks have been interested in our work. Yes? Professor, do you remember? I, so I'm getting old. Yeah. So I think it was. So they all they all mattered. I think so. Occupation and ethnicity mattered a lot. I mean, we don't mean to say that these measures are going to matter for uh, if you're looking at a different setting. But I think sort of for our setting, this is basically what was important. Uh, it's, uh, we have no information on, say, things such as religion, uh, but probably until the 1970s, if you looked at U.S., maybe religious diversity would matter, but now it doesn't matter as much. So we don't want to say these are fixed in stone. Yes? Um, so you mentioned that the high so we did it both ways. We 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 had yeah. the recent death rate. Yeah, we have the recent death rate, but also whether or not the union was winning recently. 
Well, that could include battles such as Antietam, which was technically a Union victory, but it was extremely bloody. So I think only toward the end of the war might it actually be, yeah, be correlated with deaths. We then, in, in a second paper, uh, we estimated similar models for, for, for black soldiers. And here we had, uh, we, we had uh, some extra variables that we didn't have in, in our white sample. Again, uh, a, a, so we, we switched our units on you here. Uh, we have a lower overall desertion rate for black soldiers. Uh, if you had an abolitionist officer uh, in charge of the company, and, and Dora, let me s let you speak of why this could be a causal effect of what this guy would be doing. So before you go, on, you switched units, meaning it, it's just that it's not labeled well. So, so yeah. they, they're they're both in percentage points. Yeah, it, no, well, this should have been point ten at the end right. rather than yeah. So point oh five and the other yeah, scale would point be five. Of, yeah. Just, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's just not labeled. So abolitionist officer, it's uh, at least what you read in uh, various historical accounts. Generally, men were treated better. Punishments were less arbitrary. <coughs> and from we in our work, we've been very interested in social networks. We recognize that an issue with social networks is w when new students come to UCLA, they may not know each other but quickly become friends while others may be from the same high school. And it's interesting in so so social interaction settings to think about both types of interactions. Uh, it, when soldiers, when black soldiers were in the same war company of a hundred and there were other men from their same plantation, we see that this all else equal, this sharp reduction in the diversity rate, I'm sorry, in the desertion rate. And one story for this might be internalizing the, the externality. I, there were a couple of hands who I didn't get to. Yes, please. Um, sorry to go back to this, but just in terms of abolitionist officers, how did you go about establishing whether an officer was considered we looked at was there any record in the historical accounts, um, also sometimes looking at some of the letters that they wrote to headquarters, such as key words such as uh, committed to the cause, sort of our cause, things like that. So yeah, it's not perfect. Were the officers in they, the were white. they were white. That was the so case. the commissioned officers were white, non-commissioned officers were black. And in terms for the black soldiers, our measures of company diversity, this was both geographic diversity, it's the same through geographic age and occupation of, or am I forgetting? Yeah, so it's also percent free was our big measure. Yes. And uh, it's here, because we don't have people born abroad, it tends to be state of birth and also age. We don't have occupation, and there, there wasn't diversity in occupation. I'm going to let Dora back in, 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 in. I will let Dora back in now. Okay. One of the things that people kept asking us after uh, we wrote the first paper was, uh, well, look, it's, uh, you've shown that there were a lot of benefits to the military of having uh, loyal soldiers and having a lot of social capital in the company. But what about the men themselves? Did it help them at all if uh, there was the social capital? And we really couldn't figure out, well, how do you actually do this in a military setting? Sort of, you'd need to know an awful lot of, the counterfactual is just too hard. You'd need to know too much about exactly where this person is on the battlefield. So the one place that we could look at, though, was POW camp survivorship. And here we looked at, we used two different data sets to look at who survived. We had information on individual characteristics, information on prison camp conditions and also some information on the social networks. So we used the same data put together by Robert Fogel that uh, we used before, where we looked at the advantage of these data is we know about individual <coughs> characteristics, and we can merge on what we might refer to as macro characteristics, i.e. we know how crowded the camp was at different points in time. And we could also here use company as our measure of social networks. And what we did is we just estimated what determined time until death in days. How much does it, the number of men you originally came in with matter? 
And we're also able to look at how the number of men varies by month. Where, and we get variation in the number of men by month because as, say, Sherman starts to march through Georgia, you're worried about uh, him getting to the prison camps, so you start to move men to different prison camps. So it's not, people aren't moved all at the same time. It takes actually quite a bit of time to empty out these camps by rail. What do we actually find? Well, the short have a slight advantage. Everyone gets the same size ration, so in the tall need more food. Professionals and proprietors have a survival advantage. Uh, this is perhaps because they could uh, end up being uh, clerks and actually getting some better conditions if they could find a job in the camp. Officers were in uh, better camps and they had better conditions. If you were a sergeant, you were actually the one distributing the food rations and for this you actually received extra food. Certainly one of the things that comes in the strongest is the number of men in the camp. So literally a lot of, most of these deaths are deaths from diseases of crowding. So. Yeah. Those short, tall, farmer, and so on, are those significant? You've got enough to make those? Does yes. They, they, they look so close. Yeah, they actually are. I mean, it's uh, sort of the smallest effect, actually, it's for sort of for the short and tall. And the number of friends also here, it's small. It's, uh, it is statistically significant. I mean, obviously, the biggest, the most, single, the most important factor is literally the crowding. It's uh, Andersonville, let's say if you take one of the worst cases, Andersonville, which at its peak was roughly 35,000 men. One historian estimated that each man had about the square footage of the grave. So, and so the grounds were, were covered with feces and maggots, so it was really horrific conditions. So the causes of death are diarrhea and scurvy. So it's pretty monotonous decline. But we do find that there is the small effect, and this is a sample of only 3,000 men, there is the small effect of number of friends. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Let me get back to... Yes. Um, those are survival probabilities. How is that controlling for... I'm spent in prison. I mean, so what does it mean that you survive 80% of the 80% probability? Yeah, so... Yeah, so we're basically just taking our model and saying, like, if all we changed were uh, the number of friends that you have, how would that change your probability of surviving this camp? And here we're just comparing sort of the five with the 10. So we're not even giving you kind of the extreme cases. But yeah. So the entire time you're in the camp. Yeah, so I mean, but it's, it's a you're hazard model. Hazard. So we basically are taking into account that look, some people get dropped out of the sample earlier either because they die, maybe they came in late, so they get released early and they're not in for as long a period of time. So yeah. the, the, the number of POWs Yes, so there were a lot of uh, smaller prison camp. Also, conditions varied a lot uh, throughout the war. It's uh, initially, people just didn't know what to do with prisoners, so they were rapidly exchanged. And uh, so people, even if they did spend some time in a prison camp, it might not be very long. Then the exchange system stops because they're arguing, well, how do we actually treat black soldiers and how do we treat the white officers of black soldiers? <coughs> Are they basically leaders of a slave insurrection and therefore should they be executed as such? So prison exchange is stopped. And during this period, this is when conditions get extremely abysmal. So basically, if you were captured after uh, the summer of 1863, you're in a lot of trouble. But uh, Andersonville was the most notorious because of its bad condition. There were smaller places also that were also, so Salisbury was another notorious one, but also over time. So if you look at Anderson itself, it's uh, 
if you were captured late, so Andersonville still was operating in 1865, conditions actually aren't as bad. But there was sort of this period of uh, when it was sort of in full operation, there was no exchange system, that's when conditions were really horrific. Oh, I keep on doing this. And one of the things that we later looked at was precisely what happens to men at older ages if they were POW camp survivors. And a lot of it crucially depends on when were they captured. So Andersonville, notorious and largest, total death rate, at least estimated from the Fogel data of anyone who passed through there was around 40%. The data were collected by the National Park Service. They're cross-sectional data. However, and we, however, the advantage is we can get much finer details on social networks. We can look at regiment and company. We can act, look at ethnicity because the sample is big enough for that. Uh, we can look at hometown. And we end up running a series of probit models to look at this. So, this asks sort of the what if you were in there with 15 extra men from your regiment, from your company, and 15 extra men in your company, and do they have the same last name as you, which could arguably be a measure of kinship. And here, what I want to emphasize is it looks like sort of the closer the social network, the better your survival probability. looking at ethnic networks and uh, so if this looks even sort of a looking at it by ethnicity so if you're Irish and you have 15 extra men in your company what's your survival probability versus 15 extra men in your company and they're also Irish and yes it helps to have more of your own kind with you how does it help we don't actually know. We can't really get behind the black box. Is it because these men really could physically help each other in certain ways? Is it because you're there with your friends, this therefore has some beneficial effect on your immune system? We can't really tell. Now, what we, one of the things we followed up with is looking at, there's been a major war, yes? Yeah, often the surrender was decision of the commanding officer. So it's, uh, you don't have so much kind of these men planning it. A lot of it is, so maybe their fort is surrounded. There really isn't that much choice. A lot of the single guys who might end up being captured would be men who might end up being captured uh, either as they're so gung-ho that they're going forward and uh, therefore they get separated for their own company or somehow they aren't quick enough to uh, retreat in some ways or it's sort of they're straggling somewhere and they get picked off. So you have sort of this various combination of types. We looked at uh, how do the men who were POWs, how do they compare to the other men? And on the whole, they look roughly similar. It's, uh, there are some differences in characteristics, but it's nothing really you can infer that much about. So we don't think that there is sort of that much bias in uh, who actually became a POW. So one of the questions we have is, you've had a bloody war, you have a lot of deserters. How do you actually treat these deserters? There was no legal penalty <coughs> to having deserted after the war in the sense that Federally, there was nothing. It's uh, people just forgot about it. There were perhaps, what, four states that actually had some restrictions on voting rights. But again, it's all pretty minimal. So however, everyone in the community would know who was the deserter. Men would write uncensored letters back home. So you know what's happened. So we think it's unlikely, and particularly there, we expect there would be a lot of uh, raw emotion after the war. 
of the things that we argue is, one of the nice things here is that we argue, look, often it's hard to observe what the social norm is. The way that we look at the social norm is we look at how strong was the vote in 1864 for McClellan. So voting for McClellan, the Democratic candidate, was an anti-war vote. The platform was basically one of peace without victory. And one of the reasons we're interested in this is if you look at, say, Robert Ellickson's order without law, he looks at, I think it was Shasta County and cattle ranchers there, and how do they actually, in the absence of property rights, enforce good behavior? And we argue that, look, because there is this expectation of an ex post social sanction, that this can work to enforce good behavior. And this is just a cartoon of the period. So it's uh, Lincoln shaking the hand of a free union worker and McClellan shaking uh, the hand of uh, Jeff Davis, the uh, president of the Confederacy with slaves in the background. So what we did is we ended up linking men to the 1880 census. We looked at who moves and where the person moves. And we compared deserters with men who deserted but later returned to fight. And we find, yes, deserters were much more likely to move. And we also looked at deserters from pro-war communities with deserters from anti-war communities. Deserters from pro-war communities leave but those from anti-war communities look like everyone else. And deserters who move, well, where do they move to? They tend to move to anti-war states. I'm gonna take over. And the, the one other point that I would add there is for the deserters, and Dora, correct me if I'm losing it, for deserters, we had trouble, we were more likely to not be able to link deserters to the 1880 census, which we interpreted that they had changed their name. Yes. Because the way linkage works is if your name, Matthew, and my family's name used to be Krasek, it would be relatively easy with all those scrabble points to find me in a subsequent census. Again, the, the way economic historians work is to link, somebody has to look across cross-sectional data sets and find you in two of these. There was the coincidence that we were very often unable to find the deserters in the 1880 census, that these guys had reinvented their lives. Do, do you want to add something there? We, so we showed you the results. Our desertion results speak to the costs of diversity. When both white and black soldiers fought in diverse companies, they were more likely to desert. But a little bit like the modern affirmative action literature or just policy debate, it, you're more like, when we talk about the modern university and having dorms with different people in them, you're more likely to learn from people who are different than you. That there's long-term benefits to being exposed to people who are different than you is a hopeful belief that we hold. Our empirical work sheds new light on this. In our case of the ex-slaves who were liberated and who represent three quarters of our data set uh, for the black soldiers. We then study after the war their migration patterns, their propensity to be literate, and whether they change their names, sort of a la Malcolm X, in, 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 subsequent, in the subsequent census of 1880. And so again, since I need to sober up, after the war, the war is over, you were roughly 2025 20, in 1865, it's now 1880, as you're an older adult, how, if you were a liberated slave, are you living your life? Where are you living? Are you literate? Have you changed your name and sort of reinvented your game? Are three indicators that we can study and say new things about as slaves make the transition to being free men. We document using uh, conditional logit migration models that controlling for the distance, uh, so depending on where you enlisted as, a, as, a, as an ex-slave, you were more likely to live in subsequently in the 1880 census, you were more likely to live as of 1880 in a state if your regiment had visited there during the war and if more men in your company were from that area. So this, I always crack the joke that this is like a Zagat's guide. Uh, 
which I see is not funny. <laughs> There's a question where information comes from, and you can only act on information you have. Uh, if your regiment was there, if men from your unit were from there, you're more likely to move there. And of course, we can't interview these men and say, was this, why? But, it, but it's quite a coincidence. Bottom point, illiteracy. Slaves were much more likely to be literate in the 1880 census if they fought with free men. And we interpreted this as evidence of, of learning and, and sort of a, G, a GED degree uh, during wartime, of, of wartime as a job training program. So the punchline of the book, and I think why it generated some interest of, of new high stakes empirical work on this tension between the, the costs and benefits of living and fighting in a diverse environment, and very different than today. So there's a question in modern urban economics. We don't even know our neighbors. Uh, and I don't think our neighbors want to know us. So, so in the day and age, you can live next to people, but are they really part of your peer group? Uh, and, and, but back then, with no internet, with no information technology, living 24 hours a day in the same community, th this, was, uh, this was a community that had to interact together. And I don't think that, I think that urban researchers face that challenge of how you figure out people's social networks today. So Dora, let me let you back in. So we've taken uh, this research agenda in three different directions. One of them is to look more at leadership. Uh, one of the things that people particularly, if they had some relationship to the military, kept pointing out to us, well, how much do the leaders matter? Uh, another direction, and two other directions, because one of my interests is in health, is what were the long-run effects of wartime stress? And also, can social networks help mitigate the effects of this wartime st stress? So we showed you before that an abolitionist officer did matter for the black soldiers. So that was some evidence of leadership. But uh, one of the things I also want to talk a little bit about is when officers actually sacrifice themselves by leading charges and by uh, exposing themselves to enemy fire, did this lead to more soldier sacrifice? So. There's a claim that often the most successful captains did lead from the front. It's, uh, this endeared them to the men. However, a lot of these men died. So it's, uh, you end up losing your best officers. And there is the claim out there that in World War II, at least in the US Army, there was not enough of leading from the front and that there was a lot of resentment among the enlisted men that uh, officers were not doing enough. <laughs> So one of the things we can actually look at is if regimental officers risk their own lives, are men less likely to desert? And this looks at the company level. And here we're looking at uh, what's the ratio of officers to enlisted men who are killed and saying if there's a standard deviation increase in that ratio, how does it, how, by how much does it decrease the probability of desertion? So we do find evidence that officers mattered. Perhaps the, the effect, though, is not as strong as, say, uh, occupation or any occupational heterogeneity. It's not as strong as ideology, but uh, it does appear to be there. Nanda, it's still good to be a leader, though, even if uh, you may have to sacrifice yourself by leading charges. Most deaths, after all, were from disease. So, and a commissioned officer's chance of dying was only 0 0.2 times that of a private. May I ask a question here? Yes. Go to the previous slide, please. The, and how you, re how, we, how you reject the hypothesis that, that better leaders were with better troops. So you don't think this is selection. You think this is a treatment effect. Are they with better troops? It's uh, often when you were promoted, it's uh, so the officers that are observed here are men who were promoted from the ranks. It's uh, 
maybe they had sort of more loyalty to them, but oftentimes it's a, uh, in order to really get a promotion, you have to be shifted across over to a different regiment. So a lot of the times it's uh, officers are moving across regiments and it's basically when an opening shows up, that's when you take it. It's, uh, there isn't, Washington is not deliberately trying to like put certain men in certain positions. This is all set by the states as soon as the opening is there. It's yours. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, that top, the increase in ratio of officers, what's the base rate and then what's the standard deviation rate, just so I get some sense? So you said I think it was 1 to 50? Is that? Oh, so I can't remember what exactly is. This is at the regimental level in terms of how many were actually uh, killed relative to enlisted men. It's, uh, it's obviously because they're relatively few officers to enlisted men, it is going to be small. These are all commissioned officers, so it's going to be a small ratio. So there's 10 companies to a regiment. Yeah, and then it's basically colonel, colonel majors, so they're not that many, so you've got captains and two lieutenants. <gasps> now, one of the things that I've looked at recently is uh, what are the effect of environmental insults on later health? The vast majority of empirical analyses show that there's a positive association between debilitating events. So a debilitating event could be having some sort of specific infectious disease early on in life. Uh, it could be malnutrition in early in life and the morbidity and mortality of adults more than 25 years after the event. Selection remains a possibility, and it's been used as an explanation for uh, why is there a deceleration in uh, the rate at which mortality increases at older ages. And it's also been used as an explanation for the black-white mortality crossover, though this latter point could also be explained by bad data. It's uh, we just don't have accurate statistics for uh, black births. And one way that we've looked at this is looking at what are the effects of imprisonment in a Confederate POW camp on men's later occupational attainment, their property ownership, their mortality, and also looking at uh, morbidity. And this is looking at men more than 35 years after the end of the war. So there are two possible outcomes. One is that frailer individuals die in a POW camp, and the population that remains is going to be much healthier. So these are going to be the people who anything you hit them with, they're going to survive, and they're going to live until their 90s. And another possibility, though, is that these men are left permanently scarred by their experiences, so the population is going to die off much sooner. And here, I'm only going to focus on sort of the mortality aspect of this, just in the interest of time. But I'm going to look at non-POWs and compare them with POWs when conditions were really bad and POWs when conditions were OK. And I'm also going to look at different age groups. So older men were much less likely to survive captivity, but older is age 30 at captivity. And this fits in sort of with what we know of mortality, where pretty much after age 30, sort of you start to have these increases in the rate of mortality. And roughly you can see it if you look at Andersonville, 31% of the men who became POWs before age 30 die, compared to 54% of men who were POWs after age 30. And we end up with samples of roughly almost 11,000 non-POWs, 900 POWs from the Fogel sample, and 900 POWs from a sample that I directly collected from uh, the Andersonville sample. And these men are all linked to military service, pension records, surgeons exams, and various censuses. And what you find here is there is evidence both for mortality selection and scarring. So if you're younger at captivity and you survive the worst conditions, 
you're 1.1 times likelier to die than a non-POW or a man who was a POW when conditions were relatively good. If you're older at captivity, then you're 0.9 times likelier to die than if you're a non-POW. The other form of stress that we looked at was battlefield stress. And here, as our measure of battlefield stress, we're looking at the fraction of the company that died of wounds. So if you see a lot of your buddies being killed, what effect does this have on you? And this sort of shows you, look, there is this small effect, but it is very small. You get a statistically significant effect that uh, if you're in a company with uh, high death rates, then your probability of surviving is lower. Now, what becomes more interesting is if you look at this by how cohesive the company is. And what we did in order to look at cohesion is basically we created an index based on our previous regression results when we looked at who deserted. So it's based on occupation, it's based on ethnicity, and it's based on age. And here we find that if you were in a more cohesive company, then this mitigates the effect of the stress. However, if the company wasn't subject to a lot of stress, cohesion doesn't matter. So, And what we found, what's interesting about this is, yes, there's evidence from animal studies. And yes, there's evidence from survey data. People will ask, it's a, uh, how stressed, how much stress are you under? How much social support do you have? However, what we'd argue is that, look, it's uh, the problem with studies like this is, except for the animal models where you can actually directly stress the animals, is, well, maybe I'm not interacting with people because I just feel too sick. So you can't really rule out sort of these pre-existing conditions. But uh, one of the nice things that I think is nice about our study is we can actually look at what was this effect of stress in an environment you had very little control over 35 years after the end of the war. How do they social networks actually affect stress? One possibility might be they just change how you perceive the threat. It's, uh, you may not go, as you're marching into battle, you just may not go into a hormonal overdrive because you have your buddies with you. And another possibility might sort of be literally they're affecting social networks have an effect sort of on the cellular immune response and also perhaps neuroendocrine functioning. So one of our summaries here it's, uh, is yes, being in a more cohesive company reduces the negative long-term consequences of wartime stress. And you particularly observe strong effects for ischemic and stroke-related causes of death. And you also observe it for arteriosclerosis. Among some of the mechanisms, though, it's uh, we don't think that people are are able to avoid the risk if they're in a more cohesive companies. In fact, if you're in a more cohesive company, you're more likely to die because you're less likely to desert. So, and uh, you can read sort of quotes in the period. People, I've always found comforting in battle the companionship of a friend. Another possibility is maybe this provided emotional consolation after the event. We don't really know which one it is with our data, but we do know that there were results. And in future work, I'm going to wrap up now, but let me just tell you where this project is going. It's uh, data, are, the sample is continually expanding. So one of the directions of expansion is looking more at the health of black Americans, so getting a much bigger sample, going from around 6,000 of them to actually trying to get up to some 20,000. And another direction is looking at nonagenarians and centenarians, 
men who are 95 plus, and actually looking at how do the Union Army veterans compare with uh, modern veterans today in terms of any health and mortality trajectories, and can we actually find anything that predicts who's going to live to such advanced ages? So let me end there.